This week on Christian World News, they're calling it genocide. The U.S. steps up to help protect Christians and Yazidis from ISIS. Plus, what put this on your heart to organize? When you see heads being chopped off, um, when you see people being burned alive, when you see people put in cages and drowned. Franklin Graham steps up to help the persecuted church and a miracle for a million Chinese orphans. See how one village is changing the lives of special needs children. Welcome to Christian World News, everyone. I'm Wendy Griffith. George Thomas is on assignment. After facing heavy pressure from Congress, Secretary of State John Kerry has finally declared that ISIS is committing genocide. And he's saying it against Christians and other religious minorities in Iraq and Syria. Jennifer Wishon brings us that story from Washington. Pushing it right up to the deadline set by Congress, Secretary of State John Kerry said the words Christians and others waited to hear. In my judgment, Daesh is responsible for genocide against groups in areas under its control, including Yazidis, Christians, and Shia Muslims. It's a critical first step towards protecting Christians from ISIS and other Islamic radicals in Iraq and Syria. Every jihadist in the Middle East believes they can kill, kidnap, enslave, and otherwise torture Christians and other religious minorities, and they believe they can do it without repercussions. In northern Iraq, Assyrian Christians are an ancient people descended from the first followers of Christ. We are, as Assyrians of the Middle East, are we are on the verge of extinction. Juliana Tamarazi recently visited the town of Telescoff in the Nivea plains of Iraq, where 200,000 Christians have fled from ISIS. The homes are destroyed. Uh, they're ran inside. When you walk inside, uh, their closets are all broken, the beds are all overturned. The kitchens are destroyed. Father Douglas Albazi kept this bloody shirt as a reminder. The Iraqi Christian was wearing it when ISIS terrorists kidnapped him on his way to church. They used to put, for example, piston in my head, hand it time, and just they click. The torture continued for nine days. They used the hammer to broke my teeth, my noise, and my back. The government asked several Christian groups to collect evidence. Their 280-page report lays out known crimes against Christians, including a list of those murdered and witness statements. It includes this menu ISIS produced for men interested in buying Christian or Yazidi slaves. 200,000 dinars buys a child aged one to nine. And the rules? It is not allowed for any customer to purchase more than three spoils, except for foreigners like Turks, Syrians, and Gulf Arabs. The word, and the only word for what is happening, is genocide. There's ample proof, Anderson says, that ISIS wants to rid the world of Christians. In an issue of its magazine, Debeek, ISIS published, we will conquer your Rome, break your crosses, and enslave your women. If we do not reach that time, then our children and grandchildren will reach it, and they will sell your sons and grandsons as slaves at the slave market. This is about lives, and it's about the impact on real people on a daily basis in a setting that we couldn't possibly imagine. According to the UN, genocide is acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. The only time the U.S. has designated a genocide while it was happening came 12 years ago in Darfur. Then lawyers determined the designation didn't require the U.S. to act. Secretary Kerry's genocide designation helps keep the plight of these Christians near the front of U.S. foreign policy. Advocates wasted no time celebrating. They're already working with the State Department to make sure Christians are represented in Syrian peace talks and that the property rights of Iraqi Christians forced to flee their homes are enforced. There are going to be borders redrawn, constitutions redrafted. It's absolutely essential that the Christians have a voice in this process or they will have no place in the new Syria and in the new Iraq. There's already an effort to create a safe haven in the Nineveh Plains so that Christians, Yazidis, and other minorities can return home, govern themselves, and rebuild their lives without fear of extermination. If you care about the presence of Christianity, the Christian witness, in this very gospel-poor part of the world, 
you will support the idea of a safe haven. In spite of the horrors they've experienced at the hands of ISIS, Christians in this part of the world are experiencing a revival of their faith. They have told me repeatedly, it is because of persecution that has been inflicted on them, that they have, been, that they have grown closer to Christ, that they find themselves praying more, that they, they're thirsty for the gospel more. I look to my blood every day and I remember. And this is what's happened even to my people every day. He's fortunate he's alive to remember, unlike so many of his Middle Eastern brothers and sisters in Christ. Now the same advocates who pushed for the genocide designation are moving to keep up the pressure to ensure the Obama administration not only talks, but acts to protect those persecuted Christians and other religious minorities. They hope to make real progress before the next administration moves into the White House. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Washington. Thanks, Jennifer. Evangelist Franklin Graham says it's time the world takes action to protect persecuted Christians. He announced a global summit for later this year that will include evangelical, Catholic and Orthodox Christians. Some expressed surprise at the location of the summit, Moscow. Stephanie Riggs asked Graham about the conference and why he decided to hold it in Russia. We're doing this in Moscow. And people will ask me, well, why of all the places would you go to Moscow? The reason is because under communism, the church in Russia suffered more under 70 years than any church I know in modern history. Uh, the priest of the Orthodox Church, they lost about 99% of their priests. They were executed. Baptists, Pentecostals, uh, Catholics, uh, they were taken out and shot. And so here is a church that understands and has lived through persecution. Why would we want to have a conference in like the United States where we've never had that kind of persecution or go to another country where they haven't had that kind of, let's have it in a country where the people understand and they have lived through it themselves. And that's why we're going to Moscow. What put this on your heart to organize? When you see heads being chopped off, um, when you see people being burned alive, when you see people put in cages and drowned. Uh, we work in the Middle East. We work a lot in Iraq. We have worked for years in Syria, and I get the reports back from the churches of what's happening to them. Uh, we've got to do something to draw attention to the suffering church around the world. And so much of that is now under, being, under Islam. But we also see it under secularism uh, here in this country. Uh, where gays and lesbians will uh, target uh, bakers and people like that uh, so that they can put them out of business, use the law to put them out of business. And that's why it's so important to get lawmakers in there who can help change these laws so that Christians aren't persecuted because they stand for their faith or because they want to live out their faith and they're not gonna be penalized and put out of business. What do you hope to accomplish? draw attention to the world, to, to focus on this, and hopefully uh, the nations of the world will see the importance of standing behind people and defending them. And uh, Prince Charles said several years ago that Christi Christianity will be extinct in the Middle East in the next five years, at the rate it's going, next five years. The Christian community will cease to exist in Syria, where it has been since the Apostle Paul uh, went to Damascus. Uh, the, the, the church has been in Syria since the Apostle Paul and it's being wiped out. Uh, the church has been in Iraq. Uh, the church was in Saudi Arabia up till a few centuries ago and Islam has finally destroyed the church and has killed the Christians and, has, and, has, and they had large Jewish communities in that part of the world. They have been destroyed. And so we're seeing now uh, the, the, the elimination uh, of the church uh, throughout the Middle East by Islam, Islam. And they call it radical Islam. You can call it whatever you want, it's Islam. What can Christians around the world do to support the summit? I think uh, pray, but we've got uh, church leaders from about uh, every country in the world. We'll have over a thousand leaders coming uh, to Moscow. And uh, the Orthodox are gonna bring all of their leadership from the Orthodox world. It'll be the first time that anything like that has happened with evangelical Christians. Uh, the Catholic Church has said they're going to support it, that they're going to be sending their representatives to it as well. Um, so it's, it's, it's 
Christianity. Now, people may condemn me for, well, Franklin, you're, you're hobnobbing with these people who are not evangelicals. That's okay. Uh, they represent Christ. They represent the cross. And to hear what Franklin Graham has to say about religious liberty here in America, you can see the full interview on our website. That's at CBNnews.com. Well, up next, after five years of war, a ceasefire and peace talks in Syria. What does it mean for the hundreds of thousands of refugees who fled the fighting? Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. Eight years ago, my husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. Inside every child is a hero, a leader, a friend to others, someone who helps out, who does the right thing, who dreams of what they can be, but they still need our help. What should I do? What should I say? How should I feel? That's where Superbook comes in. It provides moral and spiritual truths through situations children can relate to, teaching God's Word to the children you love. Join the Superbook DVD Club and receive Superbook's newest episodes as they're available, plus two copies to share with others, all for your gift of only $25. Get Superbook today and watch the miracles happen. of Christian and Yazidi refugees from northern Iraq. They fled the brutality of ISIS when the Jihad army took over their towns two years ago. Today, many are still living in refugee camps, dependent on assistance from the world community. The men can't find work, the children can't go to school, and they wonder, will they ever go back to their normal lives and to their homes? And we ask you to continue to remember them in your prayers. Well, millions of refugees have fled neighboring Syria. The civil war there is now entering its sixth year. Hard to believe that. Peace talks are now underway, but at least 250,000 people have died in the fighting. What started as a rebellion against the Assad government has turned into a larger conflict involving Russia and the U.S. It also fostered the rise of the Islamic State, which, as we know, has established a Muslim caliphate in parts of Syria and northern Iraq. Most of Syria's population has fled the country, causing a major refugee crisis that is overwhelmingly surrounding nations. The Christian humanitarian agency World Vision is helping many of those refugees. And earlier, Gary Lane spoke with Syria Response Director Wynn Flotten about their work. The number of people that are, that are being affected continues to increase, and the, the ways that they are trying to cope with this uh, crisis uh, by moving out of the region, by, by uh, continuing to, to move to neighboring countries from Syria, just indicates that it continues to get worse. Um, and in particular, I think it's families uh, who have children and are trying to, to keep the families together that are having a difficult time, especially with this. I know you've been helping refugees, but now with this ceasefire in place, how are groups like World Vision helping people inside Syria? Over the last six months, the... Uh, the intensity of the fighting had increased and access to different communities was getting more and more difficult. 
Um, at this point in time, with the ceasefire and with the cessation of hostilities, um, we're finding that we are able to, to reach more places uh, with a bit more security, but we are unclear yet how long that will hold. And it's still very risky, I'm sure, but peace talks are underway. And how likely is it that these folks can return to their homes? And what happens if they do? Won't they still need uh, help? World Vision just completed a study on um, uh, the cost of the, uh, the, the economic cost of the crisis on Syria. And at this point in time, it's $275 billion. And that does not include um, the cost of reconstruction. And so it's going to be an immense task. Also, I think this, the social implications, particularly for children whom we would expect to both inherit and rebuild Syria. Um, there have been 24.5 million, um, million years of uh, lost education. And so the task as we look forward is immense. And besides ending the war, what's the greatest thing the world community can do to help these refugees now? World Vision recently conducted a survey and 70% of the, the population they surveyed in the United States said that they were, people would be interested to help. 44% said that they were doing something and only 30% said that they were actually praying for the crisis. So that's certainly number one. As Christians, we pray um, for, for mercy and we pray that this would be resolved. The second thing is to, to become more informed um, this, a conflict like this, it makes people feel like they're very distant. And more, uh, when we know that World Vision is a Christian organization, and many of these victims are Muslim, so what impact does it have when they s actually see Christian groups reaching out to help them? We work with, um, with, with any group, regardless of, of religion or race or creed. They understand that we might have a different religion, but thus far we have been accepted uh, very well in every place that we've, we've sought to work. Okay, Wynn Flotten from World Vision. Our prayers will be with you and your team. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Up next, Destiny Makers, how one church changed 70 lives and the lesson is teaching others. Heaven, I hasn't seen, neither has ear heard, what God has prepared for them that love him. There'll be no more tears, There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more suffering. That's why we want to be part of it. Heaven, what God has prepared for those who love Him. Get this newest DVD teaching from Pat Robertson. Available now. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. Eight years ago, my husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. Kids, we want them to grow up knowing God's word. But in today's busy world, sometimes we could use some help. The free Superbook Kids Bible app has fun stuff your kids will love. They'll have a blast learning the Bible, playing great games, watching cool videos, All right, follow me. discovering heroes in the Bible. They'll have fun while they learn God's Word. The Superbook Kids Bible app, available on iTunes and the Google Play Store. Welcome back to Christian World News. A couple of years ago, a small Chinese village did something remarkable. 70 families decided they were going to change the destinies of children living in a nearby orphanage. And as George Thomas reports, one man used their decision as a model to care for the most vulnerable. For 18 years, Robert Glover has had a dream to see a million Chinese children moved from orphanages into local, loving families. 
that dream is becoming a reality in a corner of China's Hunan province. And it was just so remarkable. You know, what was going on in this village was the dream um, that we had been anticipating. It all started a few years back when families in Yangjai village set out to change the lives of children in a nearby orphanage. And I think the amazing thing is they started to really go deep and study the Bible and they, they found this bit about widows and orphans and it really just impacted them. And these weren't ordinary children. The children had a, had a very tough life before they were found by the policemen or be collected to the orphanage. They've been abandoned and you imagine being abandoned in a city at a very young age and not having anyone to fend for you. And we know where the children have maternal deprivation, they will develop sometimes mental illness, physical illness, and even die. These children lived in a Chinese government institution. They had the infrastructure and all the facilities, but... They're not able to get any kind of family love or care. Glover's team discovered something special about the village. People here, they give their real heart to the children. They love the children and they support each other. And that became evident when 70 families became foster parents to 170 children. All the children were placed with this village uh, from the Kuomi orphanage and up to 99% have difficulties, physically and mentally. That didn't matter to the villagers. You see, the majority of Yang Jai is Christian, and the families knew that this was the right thing to do. It is quite incredible, because I think most of us, when we wake up in the morning, the first thing we think about is ourself. These people, they get up and they think of these children, and it's just absolutely phenomenal. <laughs> Their act of love had a profound impact. Bringing the community together like never before. This is the dream that came, has come true. To see, you know, not only the mothers and fathers, but the brothers and sisters, the uncles and aunties, and then the extended family, the whole community come together. Glover believes what families in Yangjai are doing should be the model for taking care of orphaned and vulnerable children. And all those people working in institutions are going to suddenly think, oh, I'm going to lose my job. So there's going to be a bit of a fight and a battle. The better way is to say, let's work within the institution and retrain some of the staff to move with the children into the community as support workers. Glover is the founder of Care for Children, an organization that teaches government-run institutions how to move children from the orphanage into local families. He says he's simply practicing a biblical model. And we just come back simply to that point. God made the family for children. So far, Care for Children has placed more than 300,000 Chinese children in families across the country. The government has realized, the academics have realized, um, a lot of the NGOs are here. I think it's the church that's behind. The Christian church needs to wake up. In 2003, the Chinese government invited Glover and his family to move to Beijing so they could introduce this family-based care throughout the country. As a result, the government took a historic step in 2014 by changing legislation to state that family placement is a positive alternative to institutional care. I shed a tear because it took 17 years for them to change that, that legislation. It took lots of children's transformations to, 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 to change that legislation. And I think that is you know, phenomenal because that's not about me, that's about a faithful God. China says it has 576,000 orphans, but outside groups put the number closer to a million. Glover says many of the families taking in orphans are Christians. The biggest um, Christian revival in world history is happening now in China. And so as that's happening, and we're placing children in the family, it's not surprising that the, the families that are, are coming forward are the Christians. For the 70 foster families in Yangjai village, the experience has been life-changing.
呃，有的，但是困难总可以解决嘛。困难是少的嘛，是吧？最开心，嗯，很开心的，哎，嗯。For the children, it has been equally transforming. 我爱大家。我爱爸爸妈妈。Glover says the smiles here remind him of the dream God put in his heart to help transform the lives of a generation of children across China. You know, what we're giving these, these children is an opportunity to have that identity and security and love and nurture in, in, in a family and a community. George Thomas, CBN News. Thanks, George. And you can share the story with your family and friends on Facebook. Just go to our CWN Facebook page and spread the good news and follow us on Twitter. We'll be right back. Join the 700 Club and get your copy of Heaven, the newest teaching by Pat Robertson. You're going to see some amazing stories of people who have died and gone to heaven. I was free. I wasn't afraid. I could feel peace from head to my toe. I'll also be talking with a renowned cardiac surgeon. How many of your patients died and came back to life again? Dozens have in fact died and have experienced heaven. Call 1-800-759-0700 to get your copy of Heaven, what God has prepared for those who love Him. And then I'll be sharing the Bible answers to some of the most important questions people have about eternity. Pat, are we eternal beings? Do we live when this life is over? That's what the Bible says. There's no question that we are not extinguished at death, but our spirits will live on forever. Get your copy of Pat Robertson's newest teaching, Heaven, available now. When you give, smiles grow bigger. When you care, homes are happier. When you comfort, the hurt goes away. When we all come together to love, miracles happen. Life, it's meant to be lived fully. Jesus said it, I came to give you life, life to the fullest. Life in your family, life in your finances, life in your body, mind, and spirit, life in your everyday. At CBN.com, we're taking what Jesus said seriously. We're here to help you discover life. Life, live it fully. CBN.com. Operation Blessing has helped people stay warm during the winter in a remote Himalayan village in Nepal. That's where many residents have still not recovered from last year's massive earthquake. Most have little to nothing to protect against severely cold winter temperatures, so OB provided residents in the village with warm polar jackets. All the villagers, including babies and young children, received the winter clothing. Look at that. What a beautiful place. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Until next week, from all of us here at Christian World News, goodbye, and as always, God bless you. <laughs>